I truly believe that the next trillion dollar company will be, if not Deepin, very similar to Deepin in the connectivity space. Invited to the, to the Teal Fellowship Summit, where I was absolutely impressed by everyone that I met. And long story short, I just went back to school and I'm like, I need to build something. We want to solve the gap of like, there's so much supply around. We also have the demand, like we literally have, we're working with Fortune 500 companies. We know that they, they need this connectivity. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Unleashing Deepin podcast. My name is Tyler. I am your host. I'm very excited for this next conversation because this is another project in the Deepin area that really gets me excited with problems that they're solving using sort of novel and new ways to uh, to go about doing that with a really cool project founder who's got some some great expertise. But with that being said, I have Carlos on the pod. Carlos is from Uplink. Uh, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, hi, Tyler. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for the invite. Very excited. Absolutely. You know, we got a chance to chat a little bit offline where I was kind of getting caught up to speed in your background and, and learning as much as I possibly could. And I think I shared with you and I'll just reshare it for our viewers that, you know, your project definitely checks a lot of personal interest for me within Deepin. I, I think telecommunications or just wireless in general has so many opportunities. There's so many kind of broken aspects that Deepin really has a chance to solve. And so you're like a prime candidate of understanding that, really applying it. So maybe with that all being said, can you share a little bit about your background, kind of how you got here, tell a bit about Uplink, and we'll get into it from here. Absolutely. So my name is Carlos Lay. I'm uh, one of the founders of Uplink. And uh, if I have to tell the story on how we started Uplink, I actually have to go all the way back on how I got into startups and tech into all this world. So Back when I was 22 years old, I got into the, I was invited to the, to the Teal Fellowship Summit, where I was absolutely impressed by everyone that I met. And long story short, I just went back to school and I'm like, I need to build something. These people are doing it. It's possible. Let's go. So me and my co-founder, Andre, at the time, we started building a, a messaging app that would use mesh networks so you could speak inside campus even without signal, because we're from Portugal. We had signal issues inside campus. I had my brother, for example, studying in Brazil, so I knew that was also an issue. So we started building that up. As we were building, we actually got approached and started speaking with some telcos, with Dutch Telecom, and we came to the realization that, hey, like nobody wants another messaging app. However, this core technology that we developed, like this mesh networking protocol that could basically use any radio protocol available on the phone, and then we change it not only for phones, but like for IoT devices and whatever could communicate, and that kind of created our first company. So what were we doing? We were doing mesh networking protocols. So it's like we would connect devices to each other. If one of them had internet, the entire system had internet. That was our whole business model. The thing is, even though the tech was pretty good, in my opinion, we always had really long sales cycles. So I'll give you an example. We would work with a smart city company, like with a, a company doing lamp poles. We would close the deal to connect all of them to each other and then it took us like two years to actually even do some revenue because we would only make revenues the moment, well, the tech was starting to be used. And we right. saw a lot of enterprises. We've always been very B2B. And we saw enterprises wanting to launch their own systems. And their main issue was always like, okay, we need to connect at least a few of them to the internet. What do we do? And uh, we always saw that they had to do two things. One, they would spend way more money than they wanted having to work with telcos, different telcos in different regions, sometimes even inside the same cities, they had to work with different operators. So it was very expensive. Or they would say like, screw this, we're gonna build our own connectivity infrastructure, which is also very expensive. Right. And um, yeah, that was, I'm already giving a hint on how we got to, to uplink and, and deepen, but uh, I don't know if you have any question on this. Yeah, well, first of all, the, the teal, Fellowship, I gotta imagine, was quite a journey or just quite an experience being around a bunch of brilliant minds. If I'm not mistaken, isn't that what Vitalik initially got is some money to basically kickstart that was, Ethereum? That was, that was actually, yeah, that was actually the year that Vitalik got the. Oh, really? The, he became a fellow, and that was the first time I heard about blockchain, and I'm like, I was so impressed by everyone. I really was very lucky for me just to be in that event and get to hear what all these people were were doing. That is so cool. That is so cool. So when you're Understanding kind of the intersection between smart cities and connectivity, initially there was like no Web3 blockchain component to what you were doing whatsoever. It was just, there's a really long 
sales cycle. You're seeing this as being a problem. Yeah. How did you go from recognizing that to seeing this potentially new opportunity with you know, a deepened component, leveraging this, this sort of new business model, if you will, what was kind of the, the, the aha moment that created you to, or have that had you start uplink? So for me, the, the, this example of like lamp poles, it's quite a story because we were like, we were working with this company. We already licensed, they were already integrating. And I remember being at an Airbnb, looking at a lamp pole that I knew had our tech, that I knew was connected to everything else, but the system was not live because there was not even one lamp pole with an internet connection. And I remember being at this Airbnb, I had Wi-Fi, and I just remember thinking, this Wi-Fi could actually connect this lamp pole, meaning the entire system will be connected. And our tech allows it. Like we had this SDK that could run on virtually any hardware uh, using virtually any, any connectivity protocol. We used to pitch that if something connects using smoke signals, you can, you can use that as well. And uh, so the, great the thing pitch, was like, the the, yeah, they, they don't work that much, but yeah, we would, we would still pitch it. But um, for us, it was like, we can do this. Like the tech allows it, but uh, why would the owner of this Airbnb actually allow that their Wi-Fi would be used by this lamp pole in that specific case? So that was the first time that we're like, we need to create incentives. And uh, we know a lot about connectivity. Like we've been in the connectivity business for me, I've been for the past 10 years, my co-founder, even more. We have a lot of brilliant people on our team, but we didn't know much about crypto, Web3, the economics around it. So when we first looked at it, this was back in 2018, I believe. We were really looking into it, but it, it, it didn't make sense. We didn't see any token model that would actually make sense. We're like, okay, we're going to have this one token. What if it goes up in price? So it's like we could either see a value proposition for the investors of the token itself or for who's actually using and consuming on the network. And that was until we, we, we discovered and we saw like, okay, there's other models. Like we can use a dual token system, for example. And that's when we started really looking seriously into this. Yeah. I think one of the things that I have really loved and have been so impressed by with your story is that you've, you did, you know, a lot of, a lot of times you see the success and sort of the, the luster of, oh, wow, you can really incentivize the supply and demand. You guys did it without having that mechanism in place. You, you learned all the difficulties that were sort of involved with that. And then as you, as you were, you know, looking and seeing these new ways of maybe solving or bridging the gap between those two problems, you're like, okay, we can, there's a new way of potentially solving that issue and it's this you know kind of interesting crypto component but it doesn't change the fundamental business model the value proposition is still the same because you understood that you sort of validated that that was the case and now you're able to actually kind of democratize that and actually do what you wanted to probably faster at way larger scales which i just i think it's kind of unique because you know most projects either say, oh, I would just want to do something in Deepin because it's sexy. It's like, it's the new big thing or they just want to, you know, do something else. But it's really awesome that you actually tried it without the model. And now you're like, okay, here's how it really bridges the gap. Is that, is that something you can kind of just talk about a little bit? Some of those pain points or those pitfalls maybe that happened before? Absolutely. So as you were saying, when we looked into crypto, we were like, we saw it as an enabler. It's like, we want to solve this issue. We want to solve the gap of like, there's so much supply around us, like especially at the time we were only looking at Wi-Fi, now we look at more stuff, but there's so much supply. We also have the demand, like we literally have, we're working with Fortune 500 companies, we know that they need this connectivity, so how do we bridge this? So we really saw crypto as an enabler. But we also like, it's all good and we had our thesis obviously, but we had to test it out. And that's what we've been doing for the past couple of years. We were lucky to also have amazing investors. They helped us a lot. We have investors like uh, Framework Ventures, Blockchain, like on the Web3 side, for example. But then on the more telecom side, we had Deutsche Telekom, we had a few utility companies. So it was really good to have the support. And what we decided to do is like, okay, let's get the resources. Let's develop this. Let's test it out. So we wanted to, we spoke with a few Fortune 500 companies that we were already working with. And there was one that I cannot wait to announce which one it is. We're just finishing some things and we're waiting for the NDAs to expire, but it's, it's coming soon, I hope. Fantastic. But yeah, we, we, we spoke to them and they're like, this is brilliant. Like we know exactly where we need connectivity for our own systems. Uh, and we just asked them like, let us build that infrastructure for you. 
So we went to these regions, mostly in South America, spoiler alert, at least for these initial trials. And uh, it was beautiful to see. We would basically just explain people what we're doing. We're just saying like, hey, you already have this infrastructure here. In some cases, we even gave, gave them some infrastructure, like some routers, but some out of the box routers that you can buy at, at a local store. They just needed to do like a firmware update. We did all of that for them, just hosted here. And it was beautiful to see how it started growing. Like uh, we really got areas that before had almost no no coverage. And now it's, you can have Wi-Fi connectivity everywhere. And you have these real systems from these real companies actually using it. And uh, the network effect, the network effects were amazing to see. It's like everyone wanted to be involved. We started with three. We ended up actually having Wi-Fi in entire communities and regions. So uh, it was cool. That's, that's phenomenal. So we, you know, we sort of understood where the project started, how you came to where you're at today. Can you give just a quick synopsis of what the actual kind of current version of Uplink looks like? It's not just a product, it's really more of an ecosystem. Can you kind of unpack that and, and where the project's going in terms of this a marketplace component, kind of two sides to that demand and supply, and, and we'll start to unpack those in, in their specifics? Absolutely. So same way that I was saying that Web3 wasn't enabled for us, that that's what we want to do. We want to become enablers in the connectivity space. So we're building an ecosystem. This is not a product. A product is what we had when we were Web2, but for this to be a reality, it needs to become an ecosystem. So we divide it into multiple things. And I'll actually, I'll, I'll divide this answer into two things. One, you mentioned marketplace. So what we're doing, the way we start is as a marketplace end of the day. We have companies that tell us like, hey, we need connectivity here. And on the other side, we basically incentivize people, companies in those regions to provide that connectivity, either with existing infrastructure they already have, or if they want to invest and get infrastructure, we basically incentivize them for that. That's what we call the marketplace stage. The thing is, as this moves forward, we start seeing coverage in these areas and we're already seeing it. Like I told you, we started with three and we have like this entire region connected. As we get coverage, it allows us to do something else in the connectivity space. So it actually allows us to speak with all the telcos that we've been partners with or local telcos and be like, hey, do you want to use this infrastructure that is already here to basically offload your networks? And that's the second problem that we solve. And that for all of this to happen, it really needs to be with a lot of different players. So if we look at the ecosystem we're building, we, we have completely different players and all of them are as equally important. So we have what we call the consumers, which are companies telling us like, hey, I, I need data for my systems. I want to consume this data. I'm willing to pay for that data. We had the providers. The providers are people like you, me, or we actually even saw people starting smaller companies to just become providers and uh, to even invest in infrastructure and they deploy this infrastructure where it's where it's required then we have validators because one thing that i feel we don't speak enough in deepen is yes deepen i think it's like it's more than proven that can be used to build and deploy infrastructure but it doesn't matter just to have that infrastructure everywhere this the quality needs to be there like uh yeah. it doesn't matter if i have Route, I'm, right now I'm in New York. It doesn't matter if I have a router in every corner, like they need to be live. Like the quality of signal needs to be good. So that's why we also have these validators. Just we, we have a set of different proofs and uh, these proofs at the end of the day, just make sure that besides infrastructure being there, there's quality to that service. Okay. So that's, that's, that's another component. And then of course we go all the way to validators also on the blockchain. We partner with OEMs. So if someone doesn't have infrastructure, they can buy something out of the box, uh, with telecoms to help them offload their networks. Uh, and, and actually the list goes further, even to more like technical detail. We even have investors. We have people who are like, Hey, I'm willing to invest with X amount of money. So if someone on the other side of the world, they want to deploy infrastructure, they don't have the resources from it. I'm investing in that infrastructure and uh, someone else can deploy. And then we basically allow them to, well, to negotiate between each other on how they want to distribute the rewards. So it, it really involves all of us. It's beautiful. And there's different ways to be involved. Sure. So even as, as a user, you don't necessarily need to have a router at home and doing this. Like you can actually, we're, we're launching in a couple of weeks, this application that uh, you walk around the city, your phone automatically connects to the routers and it's, validating if the quality of service is there. So that helps by itself. So there's many ways for all of us to be involved. 
Yeah, I love that. I want to unpack the marketplace a little bit. This is this is like something that I'm super super interested in. Just especially recently, is you're, is a lot, you've seen a lot of upticks and talk, conversations around kind of carrier offloads and increasing you know demand for deploying these new wireless networks and whatnot. So, is is there sort of an opportunity where if you're a individual who wants to help, let's say a large like a mall or sort of a large establishment go and either enable like these carrier services or they need to deploy new hardware, you could find those opportunities and kind of negotiate or navigate them through the marketplace. Is is that like one type of opportunity that will be there with the Uplink platform? 100%. So on the marketplace, we do a few things. So one, we create what we call the search mechanisms. So again, we're really into traction and we just mostly want to deploy where we know it's going to be consumed. So the search mechanism is when we have the demand side, and by the way, we're, we're trying to make it in a way that they can do it by itself. They don't need to go through us. The demand side says, hey, I need connectivity here. So there's the search mechanism where the rewards, where the incentives are higher, but in a way that it makes financial sense at the end of the day right. for everyone. But then on the other side, on the provider side, and there's basically a few things that can happen. One, let's say, okay, the search area is actually where I am right now. I already have my router here. Awesome. Let me just enable my router to provide connectivity. Or let's say it's at the mall that it's, I don't have any infrastructure there, but uh, we do incentivize people to go there to one, try to see if there's already some infrastructure, try to talk with the owner of that infrastructure if uh, they're interested in joining. And then again, it's between them on how they want to share rewards. Or in some cases, we do see this, like people who go to these places, they bring the infrastructure because there's no infrastructure there. They basically ask the owner of, let's say, the real estate to just deploy this. And again, they also negotiate the distribution of rewards between them. We've seen all of these happen in the deployments we had so far. And it's really, I cannot explain how, how magical even, like I really found it magical to see like in a few weeks, all of this happening. Like yeah. people doing all of these things. Like we saw, we actually saw a market that was already like speaking with someone else that, that that someone else was bringing the infrastructure. So they were doing all of that by themselves. When we saw there was a system there that would, that, that is beautiful to see. That's amazing. And so that's one way people can get involved. The other side that you talked about is if you want to go and validate, you want to go actually, cause you need to ensure that the quality of connectivity yeah. is there. That's a way that's probably a lower barrier to entry, lower friction that someone can get involved and presumably get compensated or rewarded in some capacity for, for being involved in the ecosystem. Is that right? Absolutely. So there's two ways that we can do that. We validate things like one is remote, but there's another one. And we actually, I personally really like this one. I've been pushing our product team a lot on this. Uh, we just, we're building this application and you just walk around and you're automatically validating things. For me, this is almost like playing Pokemon Go, but just make sure that things are working and you get rewards for this. And we're trying to make it fun. Uh, we're trying to make it slightly competitive and fun. And uh, I don't know, like I'm, I'm, we still don't have the app, but I cannot wait to go talk with my friends and be like, oh, let's go to that coffee shop or to that place or whatever. Like I'm gonna be outside a little bit more, but in the background, what I'm doing is just validating things, getting rewards right. and exploring new place, places while doing it. Right. This is probably a little bit more speculative, but what percentage of, on the like the actual end location side, I, I don't know what kind of customer you want to call them within the marketplace. How much of that do you see being net new deployments versus like upgrading their hardware to be able to provide uh, offload, for example? Where, where do you foresee that going in terms of marketplace bifurcation for people that are interested in kind of enabling that with physical locations that are out today? Good question. So, uh, and especially when we talk about the offloading, so the places you want to offload the most are the places that actually have more traffic. What I mean is in places where there's more traffic, there's already some infrastructure there that exists, but at the end of the day, usually they're like private networks. What we want to say is like the infrastructure is already here. We already invested in it. Let us give you a new revenue stream. You can use it to offload. That's one side. On the other side, in areas that have a slightly less traffic, many times like more residential, et cetera, that's where we see new infrastructure being deployed. So it, it's a mix. But again, we still haven't launched publicly. Everything that I'm saying, the results we have are from these like still private things. And it's hard to have an entire community engage when we're still private. Yeah. So uh, we, we have some teases, but yeah, but end of the day from what we observe, and this is actually good because at the end of the 
it's really cool to have everyone involved, but I believe, and uh, people might criticize me for this, but I believe that uh, sometimes it's easier to scale when going B2B. And what I see, it's like if there's already an entire mall or a stadium or a place where, or a train station, uh, that there's going to be a lot more people there. There's going to be a lot more traffic if there's already some infrastructure there and we can just convert that infrastructure. We can actually grow quicker than if someone needs to go and deploy something new. So I have my teasers. We have multiple teasers. We have a lot of uh, simulations, but we'll we'll see. I'm actually curious to see that one once everything goes live. Yeah, no, I'm I'm super excited. It's gonna be it's gonna be amazing. Just general timelines. Is there any details you can share with respect to when the marketplace will be available for people? Yeah. So right now we we we're launching a pre-registration campaign. People can basically start getting points just by pre-registering the routers. So for us, what this help us with is like starting to map supply and uh, the map supply it's in two things one we can already see where more people are interested so again we can already let's say that we already have a bunch of pre-registrations here in new york that means we can already start talking with the telcos and be like hey this region we might unlock it from day one at the same time people also give us info about what infrastructure they already have because many times people already have wi-fi routers and they tell us what's the manufacturer so that helps our engineering team making sure that the moment this goes live, that brand, that router can basically be one of ours. Like we don't want people to necessarily be buying new hardware. Like we really want to already use what's, what's out there. Yeah. So, so, so we're trying that. So right now we're with the prior registrations. Those are live. I really invite everyone to join. Like it helps us a lot. Then we're also launching this application soon. The application, what we'll do is it's going to validate that all these routers that were pre-registered that they are actually real. Because you can pre-register a bunch of things, but if it's not real, then it doesn't matter. So this application is like, hey, this exists, this exists. And the moment it gets validated, then you start making points every single minute that it's that it's live. Uh, yeah. This is like our roadmap right now. This is where we are right now. This is what we intend to do until, I would say, the end of the year. But uh, Q1 next year is when we're targeting TGE. Actually launch this, make it public, have uh, all of this already up and running. But we'll see. Like uh, what I mean with this is like we're really traction first. We don't want to launch something unless we're sure there's going to be traction. Yeah. We're still working with all these corporates with these Fortune 500 companies, which I'm sure you know their speed sometimes doesn't match our speed. It's it's different. It's a little bit different. Yeah. So we need to validate everything from this side. We're testing so many things, but we are aiming for TG on Q1 next year. That's phenomenal. Well, and I think also the fact that you already have these call and tests, but they're real world in the wild out and actually working, you can see it. There's money happening. flowing. That for money me flowing. is the most important. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a, for, I'm like, I'm selfishly excited to see it happen because I want to start using it. I want to get involved, but knowing that it's there, it just, you know, it needs to ensure that there's sort of that maturity transition when everybody else can kind of get access to it. But knowing that it is validated on the front end before it goes kind of wide with the market is is really great um, for people that want to become marketplace or ecosystem kind of participants. From the ecosystem side, what else is involved? Uh, there's the marketplace, but you're, you're, you know, you're building more than just the marketplace. Can you talk about kind of other stakeholders or sort of other components to the ecosystem that are relevant to Uplink? Uh, yeah, like, uh, so... Again, when we talk about marketplace, I think of the ecosystem, I think of the different parts and the different players and the different tools. So I, I mentioned like the validators, the application and the providers, which basically need to use the search map on that. But I think one thing that I didn't touch is we are actually open to collaborate with other connectivity providers and other projects. So. What we are doing, and this is actually our vision, and I've, I've said this before, I truly believe that the next trillion dollar company will be, if not Deepin, very similar to Deepin in the connectivity space. So our theory is that the, the connectivity world is becoming fragmented, which makes sense. There's gonna be a lot of different players providing connectivity, different types of connectivity, but there needs to be an orchestrator. And that's who we want to be. We wanna be an orchestrator. End of the day, if there's other deep end projects, for example, also with their own infrastructure. If there's, let's say, Web2 companies with their own infrastructure, we want to make sure that all of this different infrastructure can be used by whatever demand exists. So we just want to, 
when I speak about marketplace, if I have to like go broader, that's right. where we want to. That's where we want to be. And I really believe like the the next trillion dollar company will become this orchestrator, similar to what AWS did to its market. Someone will do this to the connectivity. It yeah. has to happen. And uh, doesn't matter which infrastructure, who owns the infrastructure. Uh, end of the day. You want to connect, you'll connect. And I, and we're already starting to see this in the mobile telco space, for example. Like there's so many MVNOs right now. Like MVNOs, right. they don't own infrastructure. And that's, for me, that's kind of like a signal that's where the industry is going. Yeah. Well, and I think especially when you talk about ubiquitous types of protocols where the communication, like the, the mechanism by which these devices connect is is all reasonably the same. It's just kind of who the provider is and so if you're able yeah. to abstract that away from the end user side who's connecting and you can kind of create maybe the monet like the monetary incentives for splits or other types of ways to make it so it's beneficial for all parties in that value chain i think it ultimately just benefits everyone involved and you also solve the problem of you don't need this bifurcated system here and there where they're competing you just collude and create better service for everybody and then share the proceeds where it makes sense right exactly and on the demand side because again that's how we started i want all these companies they there's so many cool systems that are still waiting to be deployed for lack of proper connectivity like i just want them to never think that connectivity is an issue you want to connect something anywhere connected pay as you go, whatever, doesn't matter, but connectivity as a service. That's what I wanted to say. You need it, done. You don't need to spend one year negotiating or two years building your own infrastructure. There's already enough players that can do that. There just needs to be cooperation and benefits between everyone. And there we go. Yeah. I really think that a connectivity market is going to grow exponentially the moment someone can stick all of these pieces together. It's going to be beautiful. I couldn't agree more. In terms of rollout, you know, you, you mentioned that some of your proof of concepts, I think you said was in South America. Do you have any geographic regions where you'll where you'll be focusing first? Or is it going to be something that you roll out just globally and sort of see where the traction starts to come? Is that something you can talk about? Absolutely. And you should be in my investor updates of tomorrow because I'm talking about that. No, so uh, there's, there's two things. When we roll out, we roll out globally. Again, we see this as an ecosystem. We don't want to be in control of this. We want the market to be in control of this. That's why we're creating the surge mechanism where the demand side can create demand. The supply side can, by themselves, we don't need to intervene in anything, create that, uh, uh, that supply. So that is one thing. With this being said, of course, we already have some companies we work with and we already know where they require connectivity. But that's the demand. However, we're still not sure if we're going to have supply there. We can build it ourselves, but again, that's being slow. That's still being Web2 in a way. We want the community to do it. So we're at this point, and that's why people pre-registering their routers or at least pre-registering that they're interested in being a provider in that location helps us. Because if we already know that we're going to have X amount of supply in some places, we can already start talking with potential customers or demand side that we know they have interest there. Or if we see, and this is actually happening, we just we, we launched this uh, pre-registration like two days ago and we're already seeing some areas popping up that we were not even thinking. And now wow. we're like, okay, in our network, we just go to a few telcos, to a few customers that we, we have. It's like, hey, we might have a lot of supply here. Are you guys interested? And this is like the job of our business development teams. They just, yeah, it's, it's this thing. Like we make sure that we have demand, but we also need to make sure we have supply. So yeah, we're going to launch globally, but we're going to focus on some key areas where we already know we might have both. So again, if someone is watching this and they're on the demand side, if you're an enterprise and you need connectivity, let us know, come speak to us directly. But if you're just, if you want to be a provider, if you want to participate, please pre-register, please tell us where you are. And, uh, and yeah, so we know that we should target in that location a bit more. I love it. I love it. I think that makes a ton of sense. And it's also, you can also let there be demand side driven growth by getting those initial requests or sort of interest points to help figure out where you want to shape or have additional focus for other people in the ecosystem or in the marketplace, helping to provide those services, which I think is so incredible. Yeah. We have theories, we already have some numbers, we already kind of have a direction, but we've been doing, again, we've been in this space for, for 10 years. It's been 10 years since we started working and 
things change all the time. Like I don't, I don't take anything for granted. I'm, I'm sure that if I decide like, let's focus here the day after something will happen on the other side of the world. It's just, I don't want to, it's not written in stone, but again, we're, we're following the demand. We're following the supply. We want to make sure that there's the right equilibrium for this, which is hard. I think that's the hardest part in every marketplace, but there's mechanisms for it. Of course. And then again, I, I said this once, but I'll say it again. I, I think everybody will appreciate the thoughtfulness that you're putting into that because it is a key driver for success, being able to balance those two. What else is kind of coming down? You know, we've talked about so many things in terms of what is on the roadmap. Is there anything else we didn't get a chance to chat about that you think we, you know, that you can share or that's relevant for people that they need to know about what's going on in the world of Uplink? Well, in the world of Uplink, it's just please follow us on socials. Please have patience. I think that's one thing. Like I'll, I'll be honest, what we're trying to achieve is not easy. We have awesome investors. We have amazing partners, but we're still very limited. We're, we're still small. So uh, sometimes the things, they take time for us or not all the features, for example, that we know we need are still there. So have patience, follow us, give us feedback. Like we have uh, our community on Discord. I cannot even express how helpful it's being like it's so helpful for us as we're building all of this so uh yeah uh help us launch this because it's it's a big task it's a big yeah. task yeah absolutely and we'll be sure to link all that information down you know twitter discord get get people pointed in the right direction to be able to to get involved definitely point at the registration so that they can go sign up and, yeah. and be a, a a member there for when it does launch um, and then in terms of the app timeline for becoming a validator, can you just remind everybody when high level that might be available to you? Is that I'm going to say in a couple of weeks. Okay. But okay. That this is me expecting to surprise everyone. So I'm going to say a couple of weeks. Okay. But yeah, I understand. Yeah, but, uh, I... but what, what I ask is really like everyone to, to have patience. And, uh, for example, we know the first version of the app is not going to be the prettiest. There might be bugs, but I can promise one thing, and this is in the DNA of our company. Every week, like we just get better and better and better. So bear with us. We also try to reward those who have the patience for that. So we, we're, we're giving points from the get go. But yeah, help us build this. It's 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 a huge task. I love it. Well, I think with that call to action, Carlos, we'll tell everybody to go join the Discord, sign up for the app, Twitter marketplace registration we'll include all that below but i've been i've just loved this conversation every time the two conversations you and i've had i've come away thinking this is going to be a really really big a big project and uh i i don't know if you will be the trillion dollar connector in the space but Same. i i'm rooting for you to be that because i think you've got all the legs to make it happen and um if it's not a trillion it will be very very large so i'm uh, i'm rooting for you guys this is this yeah. is incredible but I can guarantee you someone will do this, like either the same model or a similar model, but someone will do this. Obviously, I hope that's us, but, uh, but yeah, and Tyler, like I, I cannot even express how fully committed we are to this. I, again, I explained that we, we started 10 years ago, my co-founder and I, we've, we've pivoted a lot, but we've never give up. We had some hard times, like extremely hard times. It's been a roller coaster. I'm not here to do multiple projects. For me, this is go big or go home, like literally. And even where I'm physically right now, like this either works and makes sense or I'll take a plane, go back home and I don't know, I'll chill doing something less stressful. We'll see. I love it. This has I to love work. it. Your, your dedication is, is certainly a testament to the project and um, that alone is, is quite, quite amazing. Carlos, well, thank you. I wanted to just, this has been awesome. This has been such a good conversation. Definitely one of the ones where I'm, learning is we're having the conversation. I'm like, my brain is fi firing with all these ideas and things that I'm thinking about for down the road. I will absolutely be a user, definitely be gonna be a customer. If you are interested in becoming a validator, download the app that will be coming out. If you wanna get involved with the upcoming marketplace, most certainly go sign up, go follow them on Twitter, on Discord. We'll have all of those links below for you to go and join. We will also have them listed on our new tool, Deep Impulse. So in the coming weeks when their app is out, you will see that on our featured opportunity right on the front page so that'll be there as well for everybody but uh with that being said carlos thank you again i think we'll wrap it up here and i uh, just want to say thank you and we'll see everyone on the next one thank you so much tyler and uh, i hope i can see you on our discord channel soon
Absolutely. You <laughs> certainly will. Thank you, Carlos. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.